Hey, let's celebrate that one more time. That's better than the Super Bowl right there. It fires me up. Well, listen, this morning, we're going to continue in our series called Twisted Love. And in week one, we talked about two voices. We got the voice of the designer and then the voice of the deceiver. The voice of the designer wants to give us life. The voice of the deceiver wants to give us death. Um, the, the voice of the designer is the voice of creation. The voice of the deceiver is the voice of confusion. And this morning, I want to hear the voice of God today on the subject of homosexuality. I want us to hear the voice of God on this subject. This is a very confusing topic in our world today. Our culture is confused. Our churches are confused. We see that culture is confused in just the statistics. Um, just in a few generations, we've seen a major shift happen in our nation. So Generation X, my generation, um, according to the studies, 4.2% of my generation identified as homosexual. But if you fast forward to the millennial generation, just one generation later, that statistic doubled, more than doubled. In fact, it's 10.5% of that generation identified as gay or lesbian. If you fast forward to Gen Z, the, the, the Gen Z is like the 14-year-olds and up of today's generation. It doubled again, 20.8%. And what they tell us is that if these trends hold up, Generation Alpha, which is like 13 years old and down, we will see 41.6% of that generation identifying as homosexual. So that is a huge shift that's showing us there is a lot of confusion. That kind of social shift in regards to sexuality is, is massive and it tells us we've got a problem and we're confused. The other confusion we find in the church, so the church historically has responded to this subject in one of two ways. We have either responded in condemnation, where we want to take the subject of homosexuality and we target that as the worst type of sin and we downplay other sins and the voice of the church often in culture is an angry voice and that angry voice has really been silenced because people can't hear the heart of the gospel because of the voice and the temperament of the church. Does that make sense? The other way that the churches respond to show our confusion is that the church oftentimes are compromising biblical conviction because of the pressures of the world. So you have a lot of churches in our culture today that are downplaying this and many are embracing or changing their doctrine and position on homosexuality to move away from a biblical foundation to more of what culture wants. We've got Bible teachers like Jen Hatmaker and Andy Stanley who are affirming homosexuality and leading their congregations this direction. And I would just say to you, both of the responses of the church are equally as sinful and, and both are not the love of Jesus. For us to have an angry voice and to point the finger of condemnation to the world is not to teach the grace and truth, or truth and grace. It, it is to come out against a certain type of sin and elevating it higher than the own sin and the sin that we have in our own life, Right? And I just want to remind you that when we talk about homosexuality, we're not talking about simply an ideology. We're talking about neighbors and relatives and brothers and sisters and, and, and sons and daughters who are struggling in very real struggles in their life. And so whenever we begin just to talk at people rather than to people, what happens is, is that we are are not acknowledging the image of God that is stamped upon the soul of all of humanity, regardless of what sexual orientation they have. But if we all of a sudden condone homosexuality, that's just as unloving. It's because we're allowing someone's life to move in a direction that's contrary to God's word. And what we need, and this is what this world needs more than anything, is the church of Jesus Christ to look like Jesus, which means we speak the truth with grace that there is a tenderness in the midst of our conviction. And that's what I'm praying happens this morning. I wanna start by looking at what we saw last week because these sermons build on one another. If you've been following the journey, you probably can see how they're building. And this week builds off of last week. And here's the premise. When we talked about sex and marriage last week, here's the conclusion we came to. And it was simply this. Sex and marriage is a gift designed by God. Go ahead and put that on the screen. There we go. Sex and marriage is a gift designed by God. Sex by design is for marriage, which means that sex outside of God's 
design for marriage is sin. And we define marriage according to Genesis 1 and 2 as this, one man and one woman united by covenant for a lifetime. And so what we saw is that God is the one who designed this, that sex is created by God, marriage is created by God, and they, the two go together. Sex was made for marriage. So any sex outside of God's design between one man, one woman, united by covenant for a lifetime, we would say is sin. So here's the conclusion we have to come to today. I'm gonna give you one major truth today. That one truth, we're gonna kind of see what the Bible says about homosexuality, and then I wanna come back with, with three applications that will help anyone today who is struggling with any type of sexual sin find freedom and hope in Jesus. So here's the big truth. We've got to come to the conclusion. Based upon last week, here's the truth. Homosexuality is a sin because it is outside of God's design. Homosexuality is a sin because it is outside of of God's design. So if last week we saw that truth, then we would have to come to the logical conclusion that this also is true if we're going to see what the Bible says about this subject. Now, the Bible is consistent. It's consistent that homosexuality is a sin from the beginning to the end. And we see this very clear in the Old Testament. We see this in, re, in, the, in the creation order. We saw last, night, uh, last week, Genesis 1 and 2. God creates them male and female. He creates sex to take place within that covenant of marriage relationship. If you fast forward a few chapters to Genesis 18, you see the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, which was, there was a lot of sin in Sodom and Gomorrah, but one of the areas of their sinfulness was the sin of homosexuality. If you get into Leviticus 19, 18 and 19, you see God's uh, law that, that prohibits sexual sin and you see the consequences of sexual sin. Among the sexual sin listed there is homosexuality. Now, something I think is important to note that the, the, the sexual, any sexual deviation you find in Leviticus 18 and 19, they're called sin, it's called sin and the consequences are consistent. In other words, God is not elevating one sexual sin over another. But we have to see that it is consistent. And so the Old Testament is very clear that homosexuality is a sin because it is outside of God's design. But what I wanna focus on, and you can go back and read Genesis 18, go back and read uh, Leviticus 18 and 19 and, and see that for yourself. But what I wanna focus on uh, for a few moments is I wanna focus on Jesus and the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. And the reason I wanna start with Jesus is because one of the misconceptions is this, is that oftentimes people see the Old Testament and we wanna justify certain sexual uh, behaviors. We downplay uh, certain sexual behaviors because we say, well, the, the Old Testament was kind of extreme. It's outdated. It was all based on law. But Jesus came and he preached love and acceptance and grace. And so, and here's the misconception, that Jesus never addresses the subject of homosexuality. And I will grant it, listen, Jesus never explicitly condemns homosexuality by phrase. But here is, the, here is the deception of the enemy. The deception of the enemy in culture is this, is that people look at Jesus's silence about homosexuality and that he does not specifically condemn homosexuality. And here is the massive leap people make. They say, well, Jesus then, because he didn't address the subject, must have affirmed it because he preaches grace and love and mercy and acceptance, all of these things. So therefore, because he doesn't explicitly condemn homosexuality, Jesus must have affirmed it. Now, there's a lot of flaws with this. This is what's called an argument based upon silence. And I just wanna tell you, if you're ever in debate, like the, 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 your argument based upon silence is the weakest kind of argument you can ever come up with. And let me give you a couple of problems with this argument specifically about Jesus not mentioning specifically homosexuality. Number one, you cannot jump from Jesus's acceptance because he doesn't speak about a particular subject. So let me give you some other subjects Jesus didn't speak about. Jesus never explicitly condemned pedophilia. Jesus never explicitly condemned spousal abuse. Jesus never specifically condemned human trafficking. Now, based upon the, the reasoning of silence, we would have to jump to the conclusion, well, Jesus never talked about pedophilia. He must have been okay with that. Jesus never talked about spousal abuse, so he must have been okay with that, or he never talked about human trafficking. Jesus was probably affirm that it's okay to traffic another human being. No, of course, that would be absurd for us to say that because we see Jesus's life and know that we can't make those conclusions. So here's the thing. We cannot take the fact that Jesus doesn't explicitly address homosexuality and make that leap because that argument of silence doesn't hold up in other areas that Jesus was silent on. Does that make sense? 
Here's the second problem with that argument. You cannot pit Jesus' words in Scripture against the rest of the words of Scripture. So here's why. So here's the problem. Most of us, some of us sometimes, not all of us, some of us, we elevate the red letters in our Bible as higher than the black letters in our Bible. And can I just tell you, the only reason there are red letters in your Bible, whenever they wrote the Bible in its original language, they didn't get a, a red pen and write that. The reason it's there is just to help you understand when Jesus is, is, is physically talking in that moment. That's the only reason it's there. So the red letters and black letters, all of them are God's word. All of those are the words of Jesus. In fact, here's what John would say about Jesus. John says this in John chapter one. He says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then he said, and the word became flesh and dwelled among us. In other words, what John is showing us is that Jesus is the embodiment of the word of God. And so whenever you see any scripture speaking about any subject, here's what you need to know. Jesus is the word that is being spoken. Jesus is the embodiment of Genesis. He is the embodiment of Leviticus. He is the living word of God made flesh. Here's the last thing you gotta see if you're gonna overcome this silence argument is that people will, will oftentimes say, Jesus didn't speak about it, he must have affirmed it. No, Jesus affirmed the Old Testament. On a number of occasions. In fact, just being a Jewish Bible teacher, what Bible would Jesus have taught? He would have taught the Old Testament because that was the only Bible we had until the New Testament was written. And so the Old Testament is something that Jesus would have affirmed. In fact, Jesus says this, not the smallest letter or the smallest stroke of the pen would pass away until all is fulfilled. Jesus would oftentimes quote scripture. In fact, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, how did Jesus overcome the enemy when the temptations were coming? He quoted the word of God. He quoted the law. So Jesus affirmed this. And I wanna show you one other passage that specifically shows us Jesus' affirmation of what God says about sex and sexuality and marriage. In fact, it's in Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, if you wanna turn there, you can. If not, it'll be on the screen. I want you to listen to what Jesus says here and how he affirms the Old Testament and God's creation for marriage and sex. He says, and he answered, have you not read? So when he says, have you not read? This is a re reference to the scriptures, to the Old Testament. And then he's gonna specifically reference Genesis. Listen to this. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? So Jesus is affirming Genesis 1 account that there are two genders, male and female. And then this is what he says. And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So it's what we preached on last week. What Jesus is doing here is he is affirming God's design for marriage and sex. And Jesus then would show us in Matthew, in Mark chapter seven, rather, we saw this last week. In Mark chapter seven, Jesus describing sin that we commit as, as, as something that comes from the heart, like it's an overflow of our desires. Here's what he says. He lists specifically the sins that come out of us is sexual immorality. Now, if you were with us last week, you, you heard me talk about this phrase, sexual immorality. The word immorality or immoral is the Greek word pornea. It's a word that means any sexual activity that deviates from God's design in Genesis 2. Any sexual engagement, whether it's mental, physical, whether it's, 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 it's homosexual uh, you know, a sin or heterosexual sexual sin, anything that deviates from God's design. So Jesus explicitly calls sin any sexual activity outside the Genesis 2 account. So I was right here for a second. I, want, I don't want you ever to be like confused when someone says, well, Jesus never uh, directly addresses this. I, I hope you understand that the Bible could not be more clear about Jesus's position on the subject. The Bible could not be more clear. Jesus could not be more clear that he recognized that any sexual activity outside of God's original design in Genesis is sin, including homosexuality including homosexuality. Now, what I wanna do, now that we've seen kind of Jesus's position, I want us to look at the other voice in the New Testament of the Apostle Paul. Now, one of the reasons I wanna do this is because you've heard Moses in the Old Testament. You've heard Jesus in the New Testament. Now, let's, let's talk about Paul. Those three voices are the most predominant voices in the scriptures. 
And I want you to see what Paul says about this. And the reason we want to look at what Paul says about it is because Paul goes beyond just addressing it as sin. He wants to help us understand the root cause of all sexual deviation, including homosexuality. He's going to show us not just that it's sin, but where that sin came from and why it is so common in the world today. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 This is what Paul says. He says, for the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Here's what Paul in essence is saying. You don't have to have a relationship with Jesus to know that there is a God. It's like if you look at a piece of art, you know somewhere there's an artist because you can't have a piece of art without an artist. Well, creation testifies that there's a creator. You can't have creation without a creator. And what Paul is saying is is that hardwired into the soul of humanity through creation is this awareness that there is a God. And that this God has set a particular order. But here's what he says. Humanity, because of our ungodliness and our unrighteousness, we've suppressed the truth of God and embraced the lie that we are the ones in charge of our own life. Now, notice in verse 24 where this has led us. Verse 24, it says, Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is to be blessed forever, amen. So as a result of worshiping creation and not the creator, here's what Paul says, God has given us over to our sin. In other words, God is saying, you wanna reject me and my ways and my order? Fine, go have at it. And here's, here's, the, here's the, the, the point God is making and what he's doing. He said, I'm gonna give you over to your appetites your ungodliness that suppresses truth, I'm gonna hand you over to this so that sin runs its course and you come to the conclusion that you need a savior. God is allowing sin to run its course so that we might recognize that we need him. So look what he goes on to say in verse 26. He says, for this reason, here's why I wanna go to 26, because I want you to see, uh, he's talking in verse 24 and 25 specifically about impurity. What is this impurity? The degrading of our bodies he talks about. This is any sexual activity outside of God's design that our sin leads us and navigates us to deeper and deeper sin. And I want you to see the progress of sin in verse 26. He says, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. In other words, he's gonna let sin run its course in our life. And here's the result. For their women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. So specifically, here's what he says. Our unrighteousness has led us to all kinds of sexual deviation. God has allowed our sinful rebellion to run its course and it has ultimately led us to homosexuality being prominent in God's creation among humanity. It's the byproduct of sin. Can can I help you? Listen, sin moves one direction. Sin moves one direction. If, if If you look at anyone who is addicted to anything in their life or have appetites that are way out of bounds like pornography, you don't just wake up one day a porn addict. It's a click of a button and a feeling and then a click of another button. And by the way, no one ever stays in that thing that they're looking at. It always gets deeper and darker and deeper and darker. And and the same is true for any type of sexual sin. Sin progresses. And this is the evidence that it progresses that we're living in a culture of high sexual immorality because sin is running its course. Now look at verse 32. It it gets worse. Not only do we practice it, we celebrate it. Look at verse 32. Though they know God's righteous decree and that those who practice such things deserve to die. In other words, there's a a consequence and humanity understands we're violating God's law. It says they not only do them or practice them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Now, isn't that the culture we live in today? 
that not only do we have as permissible for us to have sexual deviation of all sorts, not just homosexuality, but, but of all sorts, now here's what we do. We applaud it. We celebrate it. And here is what Paul is saying. This is the evidence of our sinful nature. This is the evidence of the brokenness of humanity, that we are prone to sin. Now, if you think that in this letter, Paul is just highlighting you know, the sexual sin of homosexuality, that he's isolating that, I want you to remember what he's saying is that God gave us over so that we would continue to indulge and experience the brokenness of it. He does the same thing for heterosexual sin in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you have to turn there, there was, a, there was a young man who was sleeping with his stepmother. And, and the people knew about it, and they were just tolerating, oh, that's who he is. And Paul says, kick him out of the church. Like, put him out of the church. He won't repent, put him out of the church. And then he says, deliver him over to Satan so that he might be redeemed. In other words, let sin run its course so he recognizes that he's broken. It's the same thing he says about God's response to homosexual sin in Romans. So I want you to, I want you to hear me say this. Here, here's, here's, I think it's important to see. The question a lot of people who struggle with sexual sin, and specifically, let's talk about same-sex attraction or homosexuality, homosexual lifestyle. The big, the big thought is this, well, if God made me this way, then why can't I act upon it? Like, why would God give me desires that he didn't want me to, to act upon? And so the, the idea is, is that if I feel certain desires, those desires have to come from God. And why would God give me these desires if he doesn't want me to act upon them? So let me help you this morning. God did not give us our desires for sexual deviation. We inherited that from our first parents. You see, there's a big argument in psychology that's been going on for years about nurture versus nature. In other words, nurture, is it my upbringing and, and things that I experience that creates these things in my life and my behavior patterns and my appetites and desires, or am I born with this? And that's a big topic right now among the, the conversation about homosexuality. Is it nurture? Is my behavior or desires, maybe a person's desires for homosexuality, is that something that, that was fostered in them through experiences or was it something they were born with? Let me give you my answer. Yes. Yes to both. And I will say this, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. So what do you mean both? Well, the Bible tells us that if you really wanna know the root cause of why you are the way you are and what, why you do the things that you do, you have gotta go back. But you gotta go back further than your childhood. You gotta go back to the Garden of Eden. And you gotta recognize that the moment Adam and Eve stepped out of the boundaries of God's design for their life, here's what happened. The image of God was marred and rather than being fully righteous in him because of their faith and obedience to his command, now they find themselves unrighteous and their nature is sinful, which means humanity is born with a tendency toward sin. We're bent toward sin. We're born with a sin nature. This is why Paul says later on in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single human on the planet has a propensity towards sin. That is our nature. We are born that way. All right? Now, is it nurture? Yes, as, as well. And here's how. My experiences that I have in life shape oftentimes the type of sin that surfaces. So there are certain experiences that can awaken certain sins in me. Now, here's the thing I want you to remember. And this is some of you not gonna believe this, but this is true. The capacity for every sin lives in every person. The capacity for every sin lives in every person. Why? Because we all have a sin nature. And there can be things in our life, experiences, things that happen to us that cause certain sin tendencies to wake up inside of us and then we leads us to these desires and these battles that we fight on a day-to-day -day basis. So for a person to say, well, I was born this way. Yes, you were, but you weren't born that way because God made you that way. You're born that way because you have a sin nature. And it doesn't matter if it's pornography, fornication, or homosexuality. If there is a sin battle, it is because you have a sin nature. But what God has done is he has sent Christ into the world so that he might redeem us and give us now a new spirit and a new heart with new appetites. Does that make sense? You see, here, here's the, the truth. The truth is this. There is hope for all of us. 
You see, a lot of times we read Romans chapter one, especially if you have a different position on homosexuality, you read this and you go, man, Paul is so harsh. Like Paul is so harsh. Like he is, he's, he's calling out this sin and talking about the due penalty and we deserve to die. Like that is so harsh. And I'm telling you, it is not harsh. The most loving thing that we can do is to allow God to speak into our life and call sin, sin. Because until we see our life through the lens of God's truth, we are deceived to think that we are doing what we are naturally prone to do and that it's okay. But whenever God's word is laid over our life and he exposes that, no, this direction is actually sin and it's a deviation from my design, that is actually an invitation from God into relationship. Like God is inviting us into relationship. See, Paul is highlighting the bad news of our sin condition in Romans chapter one, but he's gonna spend starting in chapter three, the rest of Romans telling us the good news of Jesus Christ, that though we are sinners, we are loved. And though we deserve death, we can receive life. In fact, let me just show you a few of those. In chapter five, verse six, here's what Paul writes. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. The same people described in Romans chapter one. He says this in Romans chapter five, verse eight, but God shows us his love in that while we were still sinners, now think about that, while we were still sinners, what sin? While we were still adulterers and fornicators and porn addicts and homosexuals, Christ died for us. Isn't that good news? He goes on to say in Romans chapter six, verse 23, that, that though the wages of our sin is death, there is a free gift from God that can give eternal life. He says in Romans chapter eight, verses one and two, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has been set free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. He would tell us in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone no matter who you are or what you've done or what desires you have, everyone who would call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I want us to make no mistake. Eyes right here. Watch this. Listen to this. The message of the gospel for homosexuals is not a message of condemnation. It is a message of salvation. It is an invitation into relationship and the same blood of Jesus that was shed for my sin was shed for the sins of the world, no matter what that sin is. You see, Paul is doing us a favor by highlighting our sin because it's not until we see our sin for what it is that we can see our Savior for who he is. And this is the grace in the middle of the truth. I wanna do something. I wanna give some hope this morning. We see Moses in the Old Testament. We see Jesus and Paul in the New Testament. And I wanna give a, an umbrella, and we, obviously I'm gonna talk about the sin of homosexuality in this, but I wanna give a bigger umbrella for what I'm about to talk about. I wanna give hope and, and an opportunity for freedom. For anyone in this place dealing with any kind of sexual sin, I know the statistics of what we just read about the trends toward homosexuality, but let me tell you, and I said this last week, the predominant sin in the American church is not homosexual sin. It is heterosexual sin. And I know in this room, it, it could be struggles all over the map from same-sex attraction to pornography to sleeping with someone who's not your spouse to, to lust of the mind that's consuming your every waking thought and you can't overcome it. And there's some of you wondering, is there hope for me? Like, what's the solution? How do I find help in the middle of this very real struggle? For those in this room who are struggling with same-sex attraction or trying to come out of a homosexual lifestyle, those watching online, I want you to know that there is hope and there is freedom for you. I'm gonna give you three truths that I believe will help you, three applications I wanna I want help you with this morning. The first is this, write this down if you're taking note. The first thing you need to see is this, is that there is a difference between attraction and action. There is a difference between attraction and action. So go back to Romans chapter one, verse 32. He says, though they know God's righteous decree and that those who, what's the word here? Like you're awake. Those who what? Sleep. 
Practice, there we go. Such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who what? Who practice them. So the word practice there is implying action, lifestyle, behavior patterns in your life. And the reason I think it's important to see this is that we gotta see that there is a difference between our attraction and our action. There's a difference between our desires and what we do. There's a difference between temptation and sin. Listen to me, temptation is not sin, although temptation can lead to sin. But temptation in and of itself is not sin. Otherwise, Jesus would have been a sinner, but he wasn't a sinner. Why? He was tempted, yet he didn't sin. So I think some of us need to breathe for a moment in the room because there's temptation knocking on our doors constantly, amen? We've gotta understand there is a difference between attraction and action. So for the person who is battling same-sex attraction, is it a sin for someone to have a desire and and an attraction towards someone of the same sex? And I would say to you, it is not a sin. It is what you do with that attraction that leads it to sin. It is what you do with those desires that leads it to sin. When that attraction occurs in your life, if you act upon it with the imagination and the lust of the mind or the physical act with your body, then you are moving from attraction into action, which then makes the attraction sin. But the attraction in and of itself is not where the sin is. Now listen, I think we all gotta acknowledge that because if, if, if attraction outside of God's design is sin, then there ain't a person in here that's safe. Because if you're a married person and you ever are attracted to someone not your spouse, then you're in trouble. But that attraction, listen, is just what it is. It's a temptation. And we've gotta differentiate between those two. And here's the thing that we've got to recognize. Here's what the Bible calls us into. This is what the gospel invites us into consistently. It is a word that we don't like talking about. It's the word repentance. The word repentance means to change direction. I'm no longer going to do this anymore. I'm going to go in this direction. I'm going to pursue Jesus. So repentance is I'm no longer going to act upon my desires I'm going to submit myself to Jesus. And now I'm going to do what he desires. I'm gonna do what he's putting in my heart. I'm no longer gonna act upon this sin. Now, here's the thing. So when we repent and we turn from acting upon our desires and we submit to Jesus as Lord, trusting in his death and resurrection as our hope, listen, repentance allows us to experience grace. Grace covers our sin, but also grace gives us a new nature. So now, yes, there may be attraction towards sin, but there's also a desire toward holiness. And here's now the Christian life. It is saying no to the things that God says no to, yes, to the things that God says yes to, and there's this tension in our life. And here's the thing, those attractions and desires may never leave you, but they no longer have to control you either. You now can acknowledge those desires and those attractions for what they are and let the action of your life be surrender and submission to Jesus Christ. We are called out of a life and into a new life. Now here's here's what the argument then becomes because of the confusion of culture. People will come to the conclusion, okay, wait a second, these are my desires. Like I'm attracted to this type of thing. I'm attracted, I feel this in my heart. This is the type of sexual person that I am. And you're telling me that it's okay to have attraction but not action. Well, if I'm not acting upon that, that means I'm suppressing my desires. And listen, I'm not calling you to suppress your desires. I'm calling you to die to yourself. And I'm not calling you Jesus is. Well, wait a second. If, like if I'm suppressing these things and if I'm dying to these things, doesn't that mean that I'm not being me? That's the cultural argument. Like, this is who I am. This is who I am. And I just wanna encourage you this morning with this this truth and this reality. Here's truth number two. Write this down if you're taking notes. So there's a difference between attraction and action. Well, if I'm not walking in that, am I suppressing who I am? Here's truth number two. You are not defined by your sexual desires. Okay? 
You are not defined by your sexual desires. We are living in a culture that wants to make our sexual desires the things that define who we are. To become the defining thing in our life. Listen, our identity is not rooted in our sexuality. You hear that? Eyes right here for a second. Your identity is not rooted in your sexuality. Your identity is not rooted in the desires that you have or the attractions or the affections. See, here's the problem. Culture wants to tell us that the apex of human existence is sexual expression. This is the mantra of culture today. The apex of human experience is sexual expression and that's how you find the truest version of who you are. This is why all of the noise in culture is happening. But can I tell you, you cannot let the culture, minimize who you are to a set of affections or experiences. So watch this. Your identity is rooted that you are created in the image of God. That you were made for a relationship with him. You were designed to know him and be known by him and for he to be what defines your life. Your identity is to be rooted in a son and a daughter of the creator that you live in relationship where he becomes your source of identity and he becomes your life. But sin severed that. And because of our sin, our relationship has been severed and the image of God has been marred. And now here's what humanity is doing. These desires and these affections and these things that we long for that are sinful, this is the human appetite trying to find in creation what was supposed to be found in the creator. And thanks be to God who sent Jesus Christ to love us in our sin to die on the cross for us so that in him we might be redeemed and have a new identity. Listen to me. You are not your desires. I'm gonna show you in scripture this transformation. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse nine says this. It says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, now listen to the list. Neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now I want you to listen to that list for a second. Because I think sometimes, again, we get in our little self-righteous soapbox and we're like homosexuals and sexually immoral people, they're not gonna inherit the kingdom of God. But he also includes swindlers and drunkards in here. Like it's tax season right now. Hello? Anybody wanna quote that one today, right? So we, we've gotta understand unrighteousness is unrighteousness. And what Paul is describing here is lifestyle. Those who practice this, where our actions are driven by our desires and we're trying to find our identity in what we do. Listen, your sin and your desires, they tell how you are but they don't tell you who you are. But before Jesus, they defined our life. This is where our source of identity uh, was resting. But listen to the rest of the story. Look what he says in verse number 11. And such were some of you. Now this is huge, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the spirit of our God. Are you following this? Notice what he says. And such were some of you. Paul is talking to the local church. He's talking to the church in Corinth, who, by the way, the Corinthian community was so corrupt. We have nothing on them in America. I mean, you're talking about pagan worship and prostitution and all kinds of sexual deviation. And here is what Paul is saying, that the church of Jesus Christ is made up of men and women who used to live this way, but it's no longer who they are. Who are they? They have been washed. They've been sanctified. They've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Your desires do not define you. When you enter into a relationship with Jesus, those desires might remain in you and they may never leave this side of eternity. But here's what you need to know. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. 
And Jesus can give you strength. And I'll just tell you my own personal story. I was uh, exposed to pornography about the age of 10, 10 years old, 11 years old. And that exposure, before I even understood what it was I was looking at, there were things that woke up inside of me way too young. And that led my life down a path of decisions and indulging and sexual behavior. Identity was rooted in the girls I was dating and the things that I was doing with those girls. Pornography entered my life and it was a battle many years even after coming to faith in Christ. And I can look back in my life and I can see that there was the seasons of life where I thought I was hopeless because these desires, I thought, listen, to have victory, those desires had to leave. I thought that those desires had to go away forever if I was gonna be whole in Christ. But here's what I'm, I'm discovering in my life now, 30 years later of knowing Christ, is that there's new appetites that Jesus has given me. And the more I feed those appetites and the more I pursue those appetites and the more I starve myself and rely on the Holy Spirit to give me victory over any other appetites, that there is victory. And listen to me, those desires towards sin will probably never leave me this side of eternity. And here's truth number, number three. Here's what I learned through my story. Truth number three. In Jesus we find sufficient grace and supernatural power. In Jesus, we find sufficient grace and supernatural power. Look what he says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse nine. He said, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my, of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You hear what Paul is saying here? Paul is, earlier on, he describes this thorn in his flesh that he begged God to take away, but it never went away. And God finally said to him, I'm not taking it away, Paul. And here's Jesus's response. My grace is sufficient for you. Those things in your life that you want gone, I'm not taking them away, Paul. You're gonna battle the rest of your life. But I want you to know in the middle of the battle, there is a grace that is sufficient for you for every moment every temptation, every trial, every hardship that you face. And then he says this, Paul, I want you to remember, my power, it is perfected in you when you're weak. See, when you acknowledge, God, I can't. God, I can't overcome this. These desires don't go away. This struggle doesn't seem to be going away. God is saying to us through Jesus, saying, look, it doesn't have to. You see, in your desires towards sin, there's weakness. And when you come to me weak and broken and submit to me, here's what happens. My strength through the presence of the Holy Spirit will give you power you never knew you had. This is why confession and acknowledgement of our sin tendencies is so freeing. Because whenever I can get honest and I drag my nonsense out of the darkness into the light of the gospel and I get people involved and go, I am weak in this area of my life and I can't fight this on my own. And I call on the name of the Lord and I surround myself with people and get honest about the struggles. Here's what happens. The power of the enemy that he has me in in darkness, he can't hold me in light. And now in this place of weakness, the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit gives me strength I never knew I had. And all of a sudden, victory is possible. You know what Paul says to this? I will glory in my weakness because when I'm weak, then I'm actually strong. So brothers and sisters, there's some of you here, you're battling same-sex attraction. You're battling homosexuality, and I want you to know that God loves you. And yes, what that lifestyle leads to is a life of sin. Christ came to redeem you from it. And there is hope and there is healing in him. Those of you who are battling pornography, those of you who are battling lust of the mind, I want you to know the same is true for you. And there is victory in Christ 
there is freedom that is real. I'm gonna ask you to do me a favor. I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet if you would. What we're gonna do is give a brief moment of response. And, and when I say response, here's the, here's the response. Put your eyes right here just for a second. The opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. It is not. The opposite of homosexuality is holiness. It is submission to the, God's plan and will for your life. The opposite of pornography is not abstaining. It's holiness. And holiness, listen, is where we tap into and experience fullness of what God has for us in Jesus Christ. And I know in this room, there are some of you and you're tired of your sin. You're tired of the sexual struggles, regardless of what type of sin it is. And I want you to know that there is freedom in this place. This altar is gonna be open. There are gonna be prayer encouragers here for the next few moments. We're just gonna sing over you. But I'm challenging you. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, the enemy wants to convince you, don't tell anyone. Don't get anyone involved. Stay where you are because darkness is chains. You take a step out and you step into the light, there's freedom and he knows that. Freedom, listen, doesn't come from the desires going away. Freedom is on the other side of humility, of recognizing you can't win. That's where power is found. God, I give this time to you and ask that you bless this moment.